You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. I am so sorry that we had to take last week off. As you guys know, I'm a part of the Maryland Black Bass Association. Uh, we basically help make laws and legislation for the freshwater fisheries of Maryland. And we ended up having a four and a half hour meeting. Jesus, God. Government makes you just want to be a libertarian and live out in the woods because it's just nothing gets accomplished. No matter how much you try to like offer suggestions, it's like, let's put that into litigation and let's put that into a litigation. It's absolutely insane. And, and the biggest thing that I've that blew my mind is if you have a fishing license and you don't have one and you get fined, that money doesn't go back into the fisheries. That goes into another slosh bucket. So you don't even get to get your fisheries fixed up in every state if you get a fine for not having your license or what have you. And it just really shows you the just the crap of government. Anyway, I'm not doing an, an RMP announcement about that stuff, but it's it's kind of, that stuff is really shocking to me. Uh, the next announcement is, guys, we hit our big Patreon goal, which was really awesome. We are having the Patreon meetup. It's going to be August 17th, Saturday, August 17th at 6 p.m. I'll make out a big announcement right up later this week. Right now, one of the guest speakers will be Tyler Highpole of Highpole Guides Fishing at Lake Anna. He's going to be talking about Lake Annis, uh forward facing owner, and honestly, whatever you want to talk to him about. I'm going to be putting out a poll for what type of food you guys want to eat. It's all paid for. Uh, all the food, drink, and everything is going to be paid for. This will be a closed event. It'll be after hours for Jay Spate and Tackle. We can come on out and have a good time. Be giving away some free stuff and also making a couple of other announcements just for you, Patreon members. So we got all that stuff wrapped up. Moment to do. We're going back down south. We haven't been to Kerr Reservoir in a very long time. I really think I like till the spring because I feel like I got into this really bad situation where I'm just following the tournament trails around, and I feel like that's an injustice because people are still fishing in these places, even though the BFLs and, and everyone else kind of left. So without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Will Nash. Will, thank you so much for coming back on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me back on. I appreciate it. What have you been up to this year? Uh, since we last talked, I think it was January. I think I was coming back from striper fishing the last time we talked. So I fished, uh, fished a bunch of cat trails, uh, tournaments throughout the spring, some curly bass masters. Uh, and I fished all the five alive trail that they had on, on bug this year, cashed a few checks, didn't win any of them, uh, flirted with it a few times, but, um, just never could get that, that big bite to push me over the end. But, um, that's pretty much it. Fish the the cat, the big championship. There's 216 boats. That was pretty cool. Damn. Um, yeah, I went down there and fished two days before that, and the bite was just on fire during all that. So that was a good time. And then just been fun fishing, doing some striper fishing, crappy fishing, bass fishing on bugs as much as I can. Uh, fished at Heiko a few times. I haven't been spending as much time as there as I like to spend usually in a year's time. And I haven't spent any time on gas, and I was telling my buddy that the other day, so... I've been seeing some nice bags come out of there. I just haven't had a chance to get there. I've been spending most of my time on bugs, honestly. Gaston is a weird cat because, um, I mean, I remember back when I was a kid, this is 10, 15 years ago, you had a lot of grass in, in Gaston, and you yeah. could smoke largemouth. And now it's like it's a different place completely than when I remember it when I was a kid. Yeah, when I was going, I like just the docks and frogging, man. That's just yep. do that all day long. That's all I'd go down there for. I do that at Heiko a lot, too. I know offshore deals uh, or offshore is a big deal down there. I just haven't spent enough time scanning out there. Uh, I guess a few spots down towards the dam, but most of my stuff's back up towards the river that I like to fish. Especially this time of year, it's such a weird transition where the weights will be pretty decent, but then you can set your watch to it that in about 30 days, it's just going to just bottom out and crazy. Yeah, it's, it's, I was on bugs yesterday for about eight or nine hours and I'm starting to feel like it's that drought that August beginning of September where it just gets super, super dry. Uh, I feel like that's coming on. Still caught a bunch of fish, just nowhere near the quality I've been catching in the last few weeks leading up to yesterday. Hmm. Uh, I think my best five yesterday may have gone 11 and a half, 12 pounds. Uh, and a lot of them are spots, um, but I'm out there chasing a school and bite. So you're going to run into a lot of spots. I've caught a few largemouth too, but just that three pound uh, wolf pack of largemouth that I like to find this time of year out deep. I just hadn't run into them. They'll be there. Uh, I think the school and bites actually turned on a little bit, a little bit earlier this year than it has in the past. Uh, but uh, I think it's going to fizzle out a little bit. And once some cool nights start coming, it'll fire back up. 
How consistent is a schooling bite to find and stay on? Like for fun, it's one thing to be like, go out, we're going to find some hook, some striper. It's great. But to say like, oh, I'm going to fish a cat or a BFL for a big purse. Is it a dependable thing or is it more of like it's a happy thing if it works out? I think it's a dependable thing if you find the area holding quality leading up to the, now they can, they can ghost you in a night and most times they don't. <laughs> but, uh, usually if you find them a few days leading into an area, they'll be somewhere close to that area. Uh, you know, main lake brush, rock, points, cane piles, things of that nature that'll hold them. Um, but a lot of times you'll find them relating to a section and it's been my experience that they'll stay in that little area for a while. Um, but again, it, the, the, the main thing with the school and bite is covering as much water as you can. Absolutely as much water as you can. Um, trying to hit as many spots as you can. But you kind of want to narrow down what, where the quality is at if you, you know, to can limit your spots that you have to stop at. That's really important. And then, as always, guys, uh, answer, uh, drop a question down in the comment section. Best question of the night will win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. This is not a, a question, but a statement here from David Stottlemyre. Hello, Will. How is that Express X19 treating you? Oh, I got bad news for, for you. <laughs> I got out of the Express, believe it or not. I don't have anything at all bad to say about Express. I absolutely love that boat, and you want to talk about a fast boat. It could get you where you're going in a hurry, but I'm finding myself more and more fishing in nut bush uh, and around the dam. Uh, and I learned a valuable lesson in that that uh, that cat trail today. It beat the oh, hell out of me and and, and my fish. Um, you know, like I said, I, I told everybody seven out of ten trips at Express will do everything you want it to do. But man, those three or four trips where it won't, when it's heavy heavy winds or wake, it just I mean it's an aluminum boat, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I switched over to a Ranger. I got a, a Ranger Z 520R. Uh, it, I lost, you know, quite a bit of speed, obviously, but what I gained in fishing platform and stability and ride, uh, I was with my buddy Tom yesterday. And he's, he's fished out of the express a lot. Uh, you know, even he can tell a difference when you're out there and one and two footers doing 55 or 60 versus the express. Um, so yeah, I switched over to Ranger, uh, jumped into a fiberglass. So, but like I said, I, I love that express. I wish I could have kept them both. I just couldn't afford to keep them both. One are, of you still, are you still running um, Garmin or what are, what are you running? So I was running Lawrence and Garmin Lawrence. before on the express and I'm, I'm running that on the new boat. I got, uh, I got two, tw two lives at the, the console. And then I got a Garmin up front and another, another live up front with that. So I'm Garmin all the way when it comes to, to live scope or to, to live view. I've seen the others. I mean, there's nothing. I think Lawrence is good. It's just it is good. Yeah. It, it could be just that I'm not willing to go through the muscle memory and the reps to learn something new. But Garmin, I can usually tell by the type of return, what species it is. And I don't want to learn that <laughs> all over again with another one. And Lawrence, I've seen it. Maybe it does differ. I just haven't looked at it enough. But it doesn't seem like it differentiates the, the strength of the signal return like Garmin does. Um. We got a question here on Instagram. Again, Instagram, guys, I can't really share it. Uh, S.K.B.P. What are your settings for your forward-facing sonar? Do you have it out to like 100 feet, 50 feet? Dot, yeah. Dot, dot. Yeah, so I run it at 90 foot out and always at 30 foot. Um, I was fishing in like six to eight foot of water a couple weekends ago and i had set it to 20 foot i won't go any lower than 20 foot no matter what depth i'm in but generally i keep it at 30 foot as far as depth i don't do anything auto and then 90 foot out sometimes when i'm in like search mode and i'm looking for big schools or stripers i may go to 120 or 130 uh, to try to find them and then once i kind of locate them i'll zero in on them and then set it back to 90. Uh, gain is usually 64 to 69 percent uh, I've, I've got all my my stuff typed out. I could um, drop it to you if you could post it for them at some point. They could see it, but uh, that's that's the ones I can call from memory. Uh, and then with you know with the, the the recent update, it really threw all my settings into a, a haywire. But I ended up I had to go figure out how to reconfigure the whole thing. So I run, wrote them all down and share them with people who kind of face the same similar thing. Um, I, I know another question is going to pop up here in a second, which is like. Is it worth updating your unit when it comes out to be updated with the software, software update? Stuff? Yeah. Well, I'd say if, man, if you got it, if, you, if you're happy with it, don't mess with it. It's been my experience. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you never want to be, I mean, I work in IT, so you never want to be the first one on anything. 
right? Mm. Um, you always want to be a couple of versions or a couple sub versions behind always. Um, cause at the end of the day, those first versions, you're alpha and beta for, I mean, for the most part, uh, at scale, you're alpha and beta at scale. They've probably piloted a little bit with some smaller, smaller user bases, but never at scale. So that's why it's hard for me to ever switch trolling motor brands. It, it's like, I'm not against PowerPole and some of these other brand new trolling motors, but it's just your first edition. All trucks has been doing it for so freaking long and I know yeah. what I'm getting with it. Well, I, I just recently switched to a quest before I hopped over into the, to the Ranger and I'm Minn Kota all the way, but man, I had nothing but problems with that. And they finally just replaced the whole thing. They were great, to, you know, as far as warranty goes, but those first two or three days leading up to the, that cat championship, I was out there, it was getting stuck. It would freeze. It wouldn't work. I called them. They overnighted a new motherboard. Um, my buddy, Brandon Curtis at Southside Southern Boat Works, he hooked it up for me the night before. I remember telling Austin, I was like, we hope it works today because I don't know if it's going to work at all. But it ended up working the rest of the weekend. But it ended up continuing to have issues thereafter. But they, again, they warranted. I mean, they shipped me a whole new product. Brandon put it all on on their dime. So you, you can't, you know, every time, every issue I've ever had with Minn Kota, they were always great to work with in terms of warranty. Is this um, all just with new products, you think? Or is it because of after COVID, the parts just aren't the same quality as they are before COVID? I think it's both of those. There something definitely. I mean, obviously the supply chain during COVID uh, impacted, you know, uh, speed to market and manufacturing, but the workforce was also impacted during COVID. Um, you know, people were paid to stay at home. So you're getting subpar labor force with, you know, sometimes these companies are having to go secure parts from other, other companies that they normally wouldn't use on their product, but they're desperate. So like I, you know, COVID boat, I'm sure you guys have heard that they're listening. Uh, there is something to be said about boats made during that time. I really think there's something to be said about any product made during mm. that time. And I don't know that it's been a quick bounce back either. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with that. Cause like some boats nowadays too, not, it's not every brand, but there's just some where they just don't seem like they're built well. And that's why hulls like, you know, there are some Ranger hulls that are 20 years old that are still going for a hell of a price because they're bulletproof. And it's just weird to think that way in 2024, some products just aren't up to snuff. Yeah. That was why that's why it was hard for me to get out of express that thing was a tank man i mean mm -hmm. it, it, like i said it did everything you wanted to do except ride well in, <laughs> in rough water um you know the the speed again i love the speed in the thing but at the end of the day in a tournament that speed did me no good because i can't ride that fast in all that rough water so i'd much rather be comfortable at 63 to 65 uh, than not comfortable at the same speed so were you running a yamaha with express right or is it mercury yeah. I was okay. in Yamaha. This is yeah. I was in a Ranger, another aluminum Ranger before the Express that I had. So I'm not foreign to Ranger and Mercury, but I really would have preferred to go back to a Yamaha. I really like that SHO a lot. Um, so I'm hoping I don't have any issues with my Mercury. I've heard a lot of horror stories. Um, so that was the only thing I didn't like about switching. Um, but so far, I like the Ranger. Uh, I like to say the rides. I've only got 15 hours on it, so I'm still. That's learning great. to drive the boat yeah i'm still learning to drive the boat I, you know that's not 15 fishing hours because i've been on the trolling motor more than the big motor uh with the bites i'm on so uh yeah we're gonna do our first service here soon so yeah we'll see how that goes i've always wanted to get yamaha the only thing was because we're on the east coast that there's less dealerships for yamaha allegedly yeah. than like out west so but yeah those those engines are just such bulletproof um yeah, it's definitely feels, something it feels like it. I hear other people running Suzuki and things of that, like you know, Brandon, my the guy I deal with a lot. Um, you know, he swears by Suzuki. Um, Japanese makes good shit, man. It doesn't yeah, break. You know I'm saying they, they, the great warranty too. They're easy to service. They're reliable. Uh, and I read an article the week this. Watch what the offshore guys are running. Those because their life depends on it. They go out there and break down. You know, mm -hmm. the, they're in deep shit. So, and a lot of them are starting to run Suzuki and Honda. So, I have not seen a Honda engine. That's like a unicorn. I don't remember the last time I saw a Honda engine. I know they're around. A, yeah, there was a fishing show I used to watch. It was two older gentlemen. I think they were in a blazer. Uh, Bash University? Is it, is it Bash University? I, they had maybe? those like buck teeth that look completely fake. They're just dentures, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah one of them had a Honda on there. I think that was the first Bass that I've ever seen. I don't think I've ever seen a Honda in person either. But, I mean, Honda is a, a you know, household brand. Everybody knows Honda. So. Yeah. Um, it's just what they, you know, what these companies specialize in, but I had no complaints with my Yamaha. I loved it. Uh, and you can flash them if you feel like flashing them and that's pretty cool. So, um, that's always fine. <laughs>
You, you mentioned that you're on the trolling motor a lot, and with with your setup running four graphs, I know with, with my thirty LV thirty four, I'm gonna have to replace my batteries because those bitches are dying. And I know I I got like cheap uh, lead acid because I just didn't at the time feel like buying the lithiums. What what's your battery setup to keep everything going? So I'm really really funny about my my whole setup when it comes to batteries and electronics. You can ask English Choice how funny I am about it. <laughs> Um, so I run in, I run in two, everything's ionic lithium, except my starting battery. I'm running one of those X2, I think it's a 34 class starting battery, but I run two 36 volt lithiums in parallel for my trolling motor. And then I run in a dedicated 120 amp, 25 amp hour ionic for all my graphs. Now, 120, damn. The, the thing with the graphs is I use the C clear wire harness. I'm not sponsored by anybody, but I'm telling you this product is worth it's money. Mm -hmm. My it cleared up a lot of issues for me just switching to it, but I didn't want all four units sharing the same harness load. So I've got one harness for my two up front going directly to my battery mm -hmm. and then one harness for my two on the bow. And I got crystal clear imagery um, with that, but it, it's a lot of extra weight. Um, but I like during striper season, I'm on that trolling motor on high 95% of the day, honestly. So I, I need that. But even to like when the bite I'm on now, I pulled the boat in yesterday and started to charge it. My trolling motor batteries were 80%. And I ran them hard yesterday. Damn. Um, yeah. So the, the redundancy there helps. Uh, I've been thinking about taking the batteries out because the one thing I am getting used to in the Ranger is the whole shot is completely different. The Express is like you tap it and it's on it's on pad and the, the Ranger's a little sluggish out of the hole. So I've switched to a four blade prop and I'm thinking about taking one of the batteries out because uh, I don't need it. I mean, I could run it all day and only get to 50 percent, uh, I feel like. Um, but I like having that extra one there just in case. Yeah, I've always it's always been this. I have friends that are if you're not first, you're last and you got to go 120. And my thing is like i don't most of the water i run you can never run at 120 because you'll be dead <laughs> yeah don't let you so it's might as well just throw in the extra battery if need be if you need it once you get there that's that very that's a very interesting point would you ever get those trolling motor breaks would you actually see a need in with how you're fishing it sounds like that's what they were made for is what you're doing yes i would i'd actually uh I, tyler trent and i were texting about that the other week i was like <laughs> If he could, uh, if he saw somebody that was selling them, um, I would. I mean, like my buddy Tom that fished with me yesterday, he said, "Man, them breaks would have been good today, wouldn't they?" Because you're you're going a lot of times those wolf packs would be coming at you, and you have less room, so you get the bait in front of them, and they may need some enticing for a little bit. By that time, your boat's drifting to them; they're coming mm -hmm. to you. You're trying to catch them under the trolling motor, and for some reason, fish get fixated on live scope trolling, uh, live scope uh, transducers. And it's like they go, they'll get hypnotized by it and they'll kind of follow that around and uh, they get more focused on that. At least the smaller ones do. Um, you mean the beam itself? The, the beam itself. Yeah. I mean, I've literally, I pulled a school of spots off a of cane pile yesterday. They just followed me around under my trolling motor for 10 minutes. Hmm. I turned the trolling motor back and they'd be following us and I'd go forward and try to get up on a spot and I'd have to get it on high to get away from them. Uh, again, it's usually the smaller schools of spots to do that, but I don't know what it is about that. But anyways, uh, yeah, those breaks, I think, would have really helped in some of those situations. But I, right now, I couldn't imagine adding any more weight to the back of the boat with the whole shot that I'm getting. So, Yeah, because, like, how many times are you on that, and what battery are they, are they going on they, to? They, like, it's a 12-volt. I think it's a 12-volt system, so you'd have to add another battery to – you know, I've already running – yeah, I'm already running four, so I didn't want to add a fifth one. I mean, I could take one of the 36s out, but um, anybody – Yeah, wow. Well, Go ahead, go ahead. Now, I was going to say, at what point are we just throw a Tesla battery in the back of this thing? Because it's insane. Yeah, I know. Gotta wait. It is. It is. But I, I will say this. Anybody that's looking to make it, I believe a dedicated lithium battery in those C-Clear wiring harnesses, or at least a heavy gauge wire direct to your battery source for live scope setups is the way to go, in my opinion. I think when you're sharing your live well with all your other stuff and your cranking battery and you're trying to pull a clear image off that, I think it just really matters to have a dedicated power source. Even if it does add a little bit more weight, it's just worth it. I think 100%. That was the biggest change I did two years ago. Huge shout out to New Horizon Boat Builds. They did custom wiring, wiring harnesses for my whole boat, redid it. And now I have 13 volts, you know, up at my graphs and everything. And that's with, with lead acid. Uh, it's, 
it's such a little thing. And I know when you go on forms, like I'll just do it yourself, but it's just, it is such a big deal. If you spend the money on the graphs to get the harness to go with it, just it, the cleanness of the image is insane. Correct. You're buying that graph for the image you see on the advertisement and you're not, they're, they're failing to tell you that that's what they're doing. They're having yep. a specialized wire harness run into a dedicated lithium battery. And like you said, I'll fire mine up, you know, in the mornings and it's 13.6. Once everything gets fired on, it's 13.2. And I have to fish 10 plus hours to get it to below 13. Um, and before I put that C clear harness, we were running heavier gauge wire. Um, but there was something through the different connections and terminal and the bus bars. It was losing voltage. I'd start at 13.2 and that someday I'd be down to 12.1 by the end of the day. And man, you're, you could tell the, 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 the degradation of the, the screen and the return as the voltage kind of dropped throughout the day. It's crazy. Let's yeah. see. We got a bunch of people over on Instagram. We got uh, the current. The current uh, says on Kerr, How do you know when the, when to target spots versus bucket bucket heads? I don't. I mean, I don't. So, in the spring, I wouldn't say I ever target spot. I, I wouldn't say I ever target spots at all. I mean, I'm out there. I'll catch anything that'll bite. Honestly, uh, there's certain sections of the lake where I think the spots started showing up. I think Eastland Creek is where I first started running into spots and hearing other people start about spots. They started spreading out from there. And then obviously the tournaments just give them taxi rides all, all to the major boat ramps and they just spread it all over the place. Um, but what I would say is when I can know I can go out and catch a spot, uh, it's usually this time of year on the school and bite just because they're so plentiful and they're fairly easy to find in terms of if you've done your spent your time scanning on size scan, finding the structure, fairly straightforward to find then you know you can always go on a long sloping point if it's got some rocks somewhere at any time there's going to be some spots on that i feel like yeah. um yeah and and honestly based on what individuals like yourself has said and, and trey when i had him on the show and and tyler and, and other people that are really good sticks at Kerr, spots are easy you have to find a large mouth generally speaking if you want to win and so hopefully yes. that also helps with the question you can go out there with a damn Ned rig and catch six pounds like easily there, but yeah. that's not going to be the different age. You no. need a unicorn. But, but, but those spots are getting bigger on Kerr. I mean, Ooh. I, I caught one the other day is almost four pounds. I mean, I've caught a bunch of citation yeah. spots this year. So, I mean, you could, you can, there's been 15 pack, 15 pound bags of spots brought in. Oh, I know wow. people that probably have caught 20 pounds of spot. I haven't seen that weight in or myself done that, but it's not far from that. I mean, it's, it's getting there, uh, especially up towards like the dam, that end of the lake and nut bush, the spots are definitely bigger up that end of the lake. Hmm. That's crazy. than like a couple of years ago when it was just a dink yeah. fest. No, it's, no, it's still a dink fest in a lot of those places. I mean, you can, it'll drive you crazy. And if you get an area with that, I mean, I just leave. I mean, there's, there's too much competition right there. Um, so if you're around all those dinky spots, I just try to switch places or switch areas. Billy Coles on Instagram says, uh, bugs is the devil. Okay. Well, Billy, that's so hurtful, but you're also on Smith mountain lakes. So that's completely different boss. Um, see, I would say that about Smith mountain lake. I need to say that about Kerr. shots fired. There we go. No, Not in a bad way. I just can't figure the damn place out to any degree of consistency. Uh, Smith mountain that is, I go up there and fish docks and things like that. I've just, I haven't put the time in up there, honestly. Um, but I know it's got just giant bass and I watch all the weights get weighed and I see Billy weights and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, it's got quality fish and probably bigger, better quality fish than books for sure. I don't know if it has as many numbers. It probably doesn't have many numbers. I just feel like it has more bait. There's got to be the reason why the, the fish are getting bigger there. It's got to be a food thing or something. There's something about Kerr that's off in the bio mass of that place. Yeah, I agree with you. I have no, I'm not smart enough to know what that is, but as much bait and area and structures in that lake, I feel like the, the fish should be bigger for sure. You mentioned earlier, if they're small, you catch them, you just leave. Do you have a number in your head where if like, oh, if I catch 28, 12 inch spots and I bug out, or is it just, you see a swarm of them on the graph and you, and you leave? Yeah. You see a swarm. I mean, you throw your bait out there and catch two or three and you can't weed through little ones. If you can't weed through little ones, it's, it's time to, time to bounce. Um, That's a really good. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it depends also depends on where I'm at. You know, if I can catch a keeper spot and I'm looking for five, I'll take any five. It doesn't matter. But, you know, if I'm trying to call up, even if I need more than one two pounder, I'm not in an area that doesn't have two pound spots. I'm not staying there. 
does running up like ever everyone talks about mid lake and down by the dam and it really sounds like the upper portion the roanoke river section it's just kind of never talked about is that because it's just too dangerous to run or there's just never weight up there no it's weight up there i mean you uh, you got guys like clay samples that goes up there and drops 20 pounds uh i don't know clay personally but we're friends on facebook and i see the bags that he weighs in so i know you can catch him up there in the river um and there's a lot of good river fishermen i think for me i've gone up in the river my my buddy gw when i had an allison bass boat it was my first fiberglass bass boat and uh tore my lower unit up up there running around the river with him but there's bigger fish in the river in my opinion um hmm. i don't run up there like clarksville area this time of year to be i don't i haven't been up there recently enough to keep it honest like there when stripers come that's pretty much where i stay at is up at that end of the lake and grassy i really don't go beyond ruds when i'm striper fishing in november december and january um, but this time of year, you know, it, it feels like as many tournaments go out of Okanichi that there would be such a congregation. If, if the theory ho holds true that bad, you know, large mouth generally don't roam one, farther than one mile. There's been a couple studies done. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know if those studies were done on blueback herring lakes, um, is, is the thing. But if that theory were to hold true, a hypothesis were to be true, then, you should just be a massive congregation of bass around Okanichi boat ramp at all times or in that stretch of lake. Uh, and I just don't feel like, I feel like I could go up there sometimes this time of year and you struggle to catch five, 14 inch fish. Um, and again, I, there, I could probably list 10 guys that would probably disagree with me and go up there and catch 20 pounds, but that's just my experience right now. Um, it is just, interesting. Uh, yeah. Hmm. I don't go up to that end of the lake, but I think there's a, a brim bed bite up at that end of the lake, but you're looking for eight bites and weighing in five, they'll probably be the right five. Uh, unless you know the river like the back of your hand, I think you can go in there like some of those, you know, some of those guys that know the river, I think they can go up there and run it. Um, but you, better be, you better be careful up there running it, I, I'll tell you that. And I think you also brought up an interesting point earlier, like this is for a lot of people that aren't maybe in your area, but like up near me, Northern Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, this is a big ass lake. And if you're running from Nutbush all the way up there, that is a pretty good drive. And so you gotta be damn sure that you're gonna have a bite up there if you're committing to that. Correct. Yeah, you gotta you, people that go up there, I think, spend a lot of time at that section of the lake um, and have confidence up at that section of the lake. It's great during the springtime. I mean, I love it during the springtime, especially you want a spinnerbait bite and get some stained water coming in there good. It's really good. Um, I got on a really good, really good dock bite up in Bluestone back in the spring um so i mean you, like it holds fish it's just this time of year and maybe i'm just fixated on this this school invite I, I look forward to it every year it's two months where i can just go out there and catch you anywhere from 25 to 60 fish in a day uh and once that happens i never get below go to island ever when this bite turns on and then i'll transition to stripers uh sometime in november or so yeah in the springtime i'll stay up in grassy and clarksville and up towards the rivers but after that i don't go up there that much and then as always, guys, drop your questions here. Best question is going to win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Here's just another statement. We got uh, Shane Flint Outdoors uh, dedicated 100 amp lithium battery to my two graphs. What he has. We got Shad Daddy that says hi. We got another question on Instagram. Uh, he asks, how long do you give a fish that you're seeing on Lioscope before you move on? I tend to have an issue where I stick too long with a certain fish I see. Uh, it depends on how how big I think the fish is. Uh, I do think a lot of people will spend too much time, you know, in a tournament situation. If I'm trying to cover a lot of water, one or two casts and just move on. It's just it's just not worth it. Um, when I'm on that kind of that suspended bass bite, generally I can tell on the live scope if they're high enough in a water column, how fast they're moving. Sometimes I'll see them if they're below. 10 or 12 foot. I'm not even going to spend the time to let my bait fall to it because you're just wasting time. I'm looking for those fish higher in the water column, the more hungry or hungry they're eating. It doesn't mean there's always exceptions to every rule. Um, but those fish, you know, that's just, that's a one cast and done kind of thing. If you get that fish to turn on your bait, he's either going to eat it or you're going to work it fast back to the boat and that fish is going to follow you in. You're not going to get another good cast every now and again. If it makes it's like 40 foot, you can, grind it in real quick and do another pitch and get a reaction bite as it lands over their head they'll jump up you know shoot up and get it um but it's usually one or two casts of fish i don't i don't i won't sit there and just repetitively cast at the same fish 
something I heard, which was interesting, and I'd love to get your opinion on it, is targeting groups, two or more, not just an individual, because it's harder to make one fish react versus a group. It, so if you are going around, you just see one. Do you make the cast? You're like, it's going to be hard to get him to be triggered, and I'm just going to continue to look for just a, a pod. No, I'm not going to let us. I'm not going to let a solo not see my bait. Uh, a lot of times, what I find the solos are the bigger fish. Mm. Uh, and there's, you know, I remember last year there was a there was a time there when it got really slow. The you actually didn't want to cast to a group because you knew it was going to be like a pound fifty to two ten something like that. It was all the solo fish that were the two forties to the three and a halves. Um, but there's something to be said about that. A so I may go to a weightless bait at a at a solo. There's competition when it's more two or three fish, so your presentation doesn't matter as much. They're they care more about taking it away from their friend than they do inspecting what they're about to eat. Um, so yeah, the other, the more fish that is on that school and bite, the easier it is to get them to bite, but the quality is usually your singles. Uh, and again, bigger fish, I think tend to, to not group up. If they do group up, they're going to be grouped up with fish the same size or damn near close to it. And, and when you mention that schooling bite here and you see a group and you said you're going to target the fish above, is it is there any validity to the fact that like the bigger fish are going to be lower in the school trying to pick up the scraps whatever falls i've seen some of that i've um we've done it before my partner austin and i we've done it before where we knew that the bigger fish we started noticing that we'd pull all the small fish off a brush pile and there'd be two blobs still left in the brush pile and we would actually throw our bait in there to pull the small ones and then come quickly behind when they were gone and try to target the big fish. That's actually pretty smart. <laughs> We've done that before. Um, but that was one of those things you're fishing and we're catching dinks. And then it's like, man, there's two still nice ones and you did it. And then it's like, well, is that a pattern? And it turned out to be a thing. It didn't work every time. Um, but we started doing that. So one of us, instead of both of us cast at the same school at the same time to get them excited, we'd intentionally try to pull them off and then have the other one come in behind it before they could go back to the brush pile. Is that generally like, uh, like you're pulling the spots away to get to the large mouth or is that also just the bigger spots won't school? And uh, bigger spots will school. I mean, I, okay. we caught, caught one yesterday. It was 260, uh, 260 or 270 spot. And, uh, it, it was it had four or five with it, the same size, if not bigger. Um, so they'll school too. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if there's going to be a size difference in, in my experience, I will see spots, smaller spots mixed with bigger spots, spots, but large mouth tend to seem to be one of, you know, within a pound, three quarters of a pound of the same size uh, as hmm. what I've seen. Um, but again, you can't catch everyone in school to weigh them either. You just can kind of go by what you see as you're pulling them to the boat and they're all their friends are trying to take it away from them. Mm -hmm. So Let's see. we got, uh, we got Everett Garner here with a question. How do you catch suspended bass? I've never had any luck with them. Well, that's basically what this whole show is basically about this time of year. Everett. Yeah. So you're, you're in good company here. So um, if, I would say if you one without live scope, and again, I've told you on the show, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I know some people hate the technology. I'm not going to have a public opinion on it other than I love fishing and I like catching fish and it helps me catch more fish and it's a tool. Uh, and I've seen people get this tool and not be able to make any difference before they had the tool or after they had the tool. So there's still something you have to learn about using the tool effectively. Um, but without it right now, the only way I would know how to go out and target them would be walking baits on points. Uh, and I'd be trying to throw up in five foot of water and I'd keep my boat in 20 foot and just try to work it out. Um, and then I'd, try to fan cast a point a few times. And if there's enough fish there, you're going to get one blow up on it or something, or you're going to see them blowing up somewhere. Uh, and that's the only way I, I know without live scope. And then with live scope, it's, you know, knowing what you're looking at on the screen and then that's part of it. Then you start to learn the fish behavior and are they actively feeding fish? Are they finicky fish? What kind of mood are they in? Are they in the right water column to be feeding? And again, if you're in a tournament situation, you have limited time. You don't want to sit there and follow fish around and wait for them to get into the mood to eat. So you're looking for fish set up the way you want them to be set up. And if you don't have it, you move to the next one. I think that's what's so important is it's basically you're sight fishing like you would 20 years ago for bedding fish, but it's on a, on a screen. And it's the same principles. Like if you can't get that one on the bed to bite, you got to move you because you can end up spending yes. all day on that one fish. Yeah. And everybody who gets live scope for the first, it's inevitable. So it's, you're going to stay, you're going to, but you're learning too. You're learning what you're seeing. 
Um, so it's part of the learning process that, you know, it's, it's not get live scope and you catch fish. I don't care. I mean, I got it in 2018 when it first came out and it took me a year of just playing with the daggone thing before I felt like I was of even average proficiency with it. Um, so it, it's, it's still a tool that you have to learn at the end of the day. And it's, it, you know, people can debate whether it's a skill or not. I know that, you know, there's going to be people that say, you know, live scopes cheating, et cetera, et cetera. I would just say, unless you're hand fishing, I don't want to hear about technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I will agree on live scope that there is something about the instant feedback loop that does give you a more significant advantage. Um, but to me, SAS scanning, it was just as a powerful, innovative technology as, as live scope. Some people compare it to, uh, to 360, but I do know there's a jump in the live feedback loop. I, I get that. I understand that. Um, but it's still a tool and I'm seeing in my experience, I'm seeing the fish adapt to it. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think it's making the shallow bite better for people. It's making the shallow bite better. There's an evolution where you need the scope now to be at 120, 200 feet because they do, they do move when you hit them with that cancer ray. They just, they just yes. do. Uh, and I don't know if it's that, or they just feel the boat now. I, who knows the, the one tip I'll offer everyone that's listening about getting better with live scope is take a crappie jig, some Berkeley gulp one inch out with you and just hit, catch everything you see. So you can yeah. learn real quick what you're seeing that, that, that was the fastest way for me to learn, to make sure like, okay, the way they stack up, these are bluegill. These are crappie. This is a hundred percent. Um, yeah. that's good advice yeah. for sure. How much did crappie fishing make you better with this stuff? Honestly, cause it, the crappie guys I've had on men, they're freaking good with the scope. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it, it helps you. It's what you just said. It helps you refine what you're looking at. I mean, you out there with a crappie jig, you're going to catch striper, you can catch largemouth, you can catch crappie, catch white perch, catfish. I mean, I've done a whole lot of damage on a little bitty, uh, a little bitty white crappie jig uh, down there, especially in the wintertime, the water gets really cold and clear. Mm -hmm. um, but now it helps a whole lot. I, I, you know, I probably ought to crappy fish more than I do. Uh, generally, when my uncle's freezer gets empty is when I start going crappy fishing. Uh, he'll call and remind me that his freezer is empty, so I'll go. Um, but uh, I like going in February, March. That's when they're really big, like the crappy, and they're out there suspended. The big singles are out there, and you go out there and catch, you know, two-plus-pound crappies then. Um, and I usually go around May some. But right now, it's just so much fun going out there catching these fish on this, this school and bite that – that's kind of what it's occupying my time. We have a really fun question here, and this is actually something I don't think I've brought up before. Uh, we got Chris that says, uh, just want to say, whoa, to the three big fat ones on the wall behind you, totally off topic, but what's your PB? Do you have a story for all those fish? I do. Uh, the one up top is the closest I've come to 10 pounds. It's one ounce short of 10 pounds on two different scales, and it broke my heart. Oh, um, my the one below it uh, was eight pounds and 15 ounces, I think, eight pounds and 14. And then the other one was like eight, six. Uh, all of them came off a of spinnerbait. <laughs> Crap. Yeah. Yeah. And then the striper over there, that was my biggest uh, on bugs. It's 33 inches. That's um, a pig. Good Lord. Yeah. I caught that one in grassy four years ago. I think it's a pig for, I mean, it's anything over 30 inches at bugs is a, is a nice fish. You know, Smith Mountain Lake is completely different. Um, but yeah, those are, that's the story of those three, but all just on a, on a spinner bait and watersheds uh, within 10 miles of my house. That was my next question. Is like, are they Mexico fish or is it actually? No, fish? no, no, no. They were on watersheds, like that's 15 cool. acre impoundment type watersheds um yeah that's what they are i think the biggest fish i've ever caught out of a public lake was seven pounds and that was out of heiko uh, seven's not, not 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 too shabby either dude that's that's pretty no cool. i was carolina rigging a cinco out of a community hole that i think two months ago produced like 28 pound bag it's like everybody knows about it. a lot of big fish set up there it's a timing deal um <laughs> But yeah, I caught a seven pound out of there. But I mean, Heiko has got 10 pluses in it. That's why I try to get there in the spring as much as I can. There was 11 caught out of there last year and another 10. Um, so that's that, got big fish in it too. That Carolina, Virginia border area is so fun. Um, there's just so many lakes that you, unless, if all you did was fish BFLs and tournaments, there's so many lakes that don't get touched, but they yeah. look really cool to go explore. And that's fascinating because 
I feel like there's a lot of anglers. You just, unless a BFL or a cat goes there, you'll just won't fish it. I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just a fun fisherman. I dabble in tournaments. I do like to compete. I like to learn. Uh, and sometimes, you know, competing against other people, you learn faster. But uh, at the end of the day, I just like to fish, period. Um, so, yeah, Heiko is a great lake. To, to, it's got numbers, but it's got quality in it, too. I mean, like I said, I've caught a bunch of fish over five in that lake. I love that lake. You can go do docks. You can fish offshore if you want to fish offshore. You can do this suspended bite. Like it's like Smith Mountain Lake and Bugs Island, not necessarily in setup, but the type of bites you can get on. Got together and had a baby, a very smaller baby. Um, and it's just a bunch of different stuff you can do on it. So I, I love Heiko. So freaking cool. And we got we got a fun one here. No, not not a spinner bait bite. If you don't know, guys, Shane Flynn Outdoors, he caught a uh, Shane, you're gonna have to speak for this, a 32 or 35 pound bag this summer out of a like Fred, uh, a Fredericksburg area lake. And this is a great thing that I was gonna bring up. What the hell is it with the spinnerbait at Kerr? Like, there are just some lakes that get a weird bait that works for them. Is it the color of the water or something? Because it's always been a thing there. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, it has been a thing. Uh, you throw in, you know, them, big swim baits, swim jigs. I think all three of those uh, produce a good bite. But there is something about throwing a spinnerbait, um, beating it up against the brushes, against wood. I think it's just a lot of shad in it in the lake. You know, obviously there's a lot of thread fin, there's a lot of gizzard shad, a lot of bluebacks. So I think because that's the primary forage that it just shines. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say normally it keeps a twang. I call it a twang, like a tinge to the water. Um, like last year, I remember being up towards a dam. I could see, I was sitting in 14 foot of water and could see fish swimming on the bottom. Like that's how clear it was. Um, yeah, and this was in uh, April or May is how clear it was. So it feels like it gets clearer and clearer, but um, I think most of your spinnerbait fishermen are in the back of nut bush, up towards grassy Clarksville, in the back of pockets, things of that nature, uh, unless the whole lake is kind of muddied up a little bit or stained up a little bit from the spring rains. What's your spinnerbait setup? 12-pound fluorocarbon, 1620? Like, what, what do you go with? Um, it depends if I'm fishing like shallow around cover, I like to do 16 to 18 pound. I don't fish nothing but sunline shooter and FC sniper. Um, and then sometimes when I'm throwing like a smaller three bladed, trying to be a little bit more finesse, I go to 12 or 14 pounds. Uh, it just depends on how stained the water is, how much wind's blowing and how much cover I'm fishing around. How sensitive do you like your rod? Is it more of like a chatterbait crankbait rod or are you going to go a little bit more sensitive? No, nah, I yank on them when they, when they, so once I feel the bite, it's not an instant, you know, slack hook set, but it's like a lean and I'm trying to lean into them. So I fish a medium heavy. I usually don't like anything over seven foot. I'm 5'11 and I like shorter rods for accurate casting. A lot of times uh, when I'm fishing a spinner bait, you're, you're trying to look for accurate casts. And that's not, that's the other thing I, you know, when I first started fishing, I thought you just had to go bomb a spinner bait and it's mm -hmm. a lot of flipping and pitching it you know it's as soon as it hits the water three or four real turns and it's on and then you just reel in and you're on to the next one um so I, I like something where i can pitch accurately in a medium heavy uh as far as you know the, the action of the rod there was one classic it was a while ago because aaron martins was in it and i think it was on the white river chain of lakes and he pulled out like this pistol grip rod so he could like roll cast his crankbaits through the docks and it was like it was like five feet and it was insane but him going on his tire he just talked about it like when you have these short rods you know I, he basically just as cliff always says like i don't have to make a bomb cast like you said like i can just roll cast and i'm just precise with everything I wish the manufacturers would start coming back with rods like that specifically for like dock fishing and, and close quarters combat because everything just feels generically either six to eight feet now. There's yeah. none of those specific rods anymore. The uh, Luz makes a six eight extra heavy power that I actually use for hmm. skipping mag skipping mag drafts. Um, so you need something heavy so you can actually get it under there, and a lot of times those fish hit it and it's pushing it to you. Um, so even with the treble hook on the mag draft, um, you know, that heavy, but sometimes I'll throw a, a six cents whale swim bait. Uh, they, they look like a mag draft, but they, I don't know how to dance for, they kind of have more like a bigger body shimmy to it. Yeah. A bigger so I'll throw that on a big single treble hook, especially in weeds. And I'll use that six, eight extra heavy for that. And obviously that's a big seven aught hook. 
um, and you want to you want to yank on those fish to get that hook in there. But yeah, I, I like a I like a shorter rod. The biggest rods I do throw out on my A rig, I throw like a seven eleven. Throw a lose extra heavy on the heavy to extra heavy on those. But generally, I'm in that six eight to seven one seven two range. I don't like a really long rod. Mm. At all. I mean, the reels now, you can bomb cast stuff with seven foot rods. You don't need a giant rod um, always. And again, like I'm not super tall either. So I like a, a, a smaller rod to, to roll cast with. You know, we got Dave Lawrence that says the old timers will tell you that those short rods are better for throwing spinner baits for the same reason. I might, I'm going to probably talk to one of my sponsors, Katakton, about getting like a custom rod made for that because that's, I'm really starting to see the benefits there. David also said Greenbrier and Hagerstown, if you're looking for trophies, I don't know if you're beat joking or not, but that place gets stocked with so many trout. I wouldn't be shocked with that. Oh, uh, let's look over on Instagram. We got some questions here. We got the current again. Uh, if Nutbush and the Dam are off limits in a tournament this weekend, where would you start fishing? Like up lake, mid lake, I guess would be good breakdowns of that. Uh, if the dam, so I'm assuming everything past Custawilla, I'd probably stay in around Ruds and the Ivy Hill area. Uh, if I wanted to keep chasing the a school invite, but there's a brim bid bite still going on. I mean, it's not as hardcore as it was in June and July, but it's still going on. So you can always run. And there's still a, there's still a shallow bite going on too around wood. I think you just got to find the right areas of the lake that bites not going on in a bunch of areas of the lake. So I'm not going to say where they're at. Um, Cause I got some friends that are fishing those, those sections of the lake, but there is a shallow bite still going on. I think you can still go catch 15 to 18 pounds doing it too. Um, but I'd probably stay around Abbey Hill and Ruds. And uh, if it wasn't a tournament, I'd probably go into Clarksville just because sitting here talking with you about it, I realize I haven't been up there in a while. And I just, sometimes I need to change the scenery. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and to the blue uh, brim bed, we talked about Billy Coles about this on the show. And I've talked about it before, you know, around the full moon guys is a better time to also target that bite. Um, it's very, it, it goes in waves just like the bass spawn. So it's something yeah. that you can check on, always check on it. Um, but don't just be have blind faith that it'll work for you. Yeah, I've I've had a lot of disappointing days chasing that ghost bite. And it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really disappointing days where you spent the day before doing nothing but going and checking the bids and looking and seeing the fish, and then come back the next day and either they're there and you can't get the bite, or they're just they've ghosted completely. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll break your heart for sure. And and you're right, like that's is that schooling bite down there just because of the blueback? Is there just a higher concentration of bait? You think in that part I think of the it's a higher concentration of bait? I think the that's probably where a lot of the water stays the most stable. That um, makes sense. I do, I do think they like stability. I think the bait likes some of that stability, and that's why they stay down there and that obviously brings the fish. And I think a lot of the structure that holds these fish, people have put more of it out, you know, around those areas. I mean, that's a giant area of the lake, like you said. I mean, grassy creeks fill with brush piles and yeah. some cane piles too, but um yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just assume because the baits stayed around. I know a lot of the bluebacks stay around the dam and the mouth of nut bush. I think they you know make it as far as, you know, the the big point that splits the two. Um, I don't know how far beyond that, that they go very often. Yeah, I think you guys like and, and like the concurrent was saying, um, you can't fish the whole lake. And I think this is what will really hurt people in the area. Kerr is really one of the only freaky freak lakes we have. I know if you live in the Carolinas, Alabama, you have a lot of lakes this size, but it, it can be intimidating if you're trying to go running down the whole freaking lake. Um, let's see. We got a couple more. We got a ton of comments that came in. Uh, we got Shane Flynn Outdoors. Uh, are you fishing large glide baits on Kerr? Yes, I do. Over brush piles. Um, that's one of those deals too, man. It's like, you're probably going to see a glad bait on my deck all year round, uh, except for like late winter when I'm, cause I even got stripers to react to it last year. I, did, I couldn't get any to, to actually commit to it. I got them to bite it and swat at it. Um, but I'm not going to sit there and watch stripers do that for long, just for the sake of saying I caught one on a glad bait, but yeah, glad baits over brush piles are really good uh, around rock, but it's to, it's the type of weather in my experience is when they're really going to turn on or not. Mm -hmm. You can get, some heavy winds. I think heavy winds really helped that. Best helped that. Um, but some kind of ripple on the water is going to make that bite better. Uh, unless you're targeting structure with it. I mean, then you kind of want it kind of like glass so you can kind of see the bite. I feel like um, it's harder to learn the glide bait bite than it is live. 
honestly. It's I've died so many tournaments this year. I had a friend, he makes glide baits, got in the boat with him. We caught 38 pounds. It was insane. Never seen it before. And I was like, you know what? This is the key for me cashing checks. Put that in the boat for two freaking tournaments and got my ass kicked. Didn't catch shit. So yeah. it's not instantaneous at all. No, and there I mean you I think people that are hardcore glide bait fishermen they're they're okay going out there and blanking because they're out there for a you know a five six plus pound bass so that you know that's their thing where i like to, i still like to catch numbers i tell everybody if i can go out there and catch me 52 pounders i'm tickled to death i had a great mm. day i don't have to go out there and catch giants to have a good day um but yes glide baits definitely do work on cur but to your point thomas you gotta know what you're doing with it and you either got to live by it or die by it. And I genuinely try to throw it to test it out. If the conditions are right, if I get enough of them to act right with it, I'll keep it in my hand. But if not, it just gets put on the deck and it stays there all day. 100%. All right, guys, you got a couple more questions here. We're going to get through. Uh, let's see. You got another one from Instagram. And then guys, if you want your questions shared on the show, Instagram, for some reason, will not let me share the comments. Neither will Twitter or X go on over to YouTube or Facebook. I can share it. We got, I am, Critine, I am Critine. Uh, Critin? I don't know, dude. I'm sorry. What would you do if you had no live scope or any grass on your boat and are coming out on Ivy Hill? What would you do to catch some fish, bass, or striper? Doesn't matter. Uh, first thing in the morning, I would try to find some fish surfacing or a point where you're seeing them surface more. I think the stripers are surfacing now in the morning, some around that area um so if I, i'd probably just go looking around for that for the first hour uh and then after that i mean i'd go throw some crankbait on some rock uh probably no deeper than 10 foot uh i'd throw a lot of throw a lot of that and then throw a lot of top water frogs pop bars whopper ploppers covering water as much as you can um in the back of pockets and just fish wood i mean I, everybody's probably going to be doing that without electronics but um that's probably still the best way to get bit out there in my experience if, if you're really doing it uh wood's always going to hold fish wood and rock are always going to hold fish on on bugs in 10 foot or less it's just how you just get in the area that's holding them and you got to cover enough of those spots so fish fast is what i would say too don't get hung up you know going in a robot mode um fish high percentage areas and move high percentage areas and move I think it's very unique that it's hard to find anglers that are good at fishing like the Potomac and Kerr. It, they do exist, but because it's such different styles of I camp in a grass bed for eight hours versus I need to burn 200 gallons of fuel. And, and yeah. it's it, it's interesting. I had, God, I forget his name. He won one of the BFLs at, at Kerr this year. And I asked him about that off air. It's like the place that gives me a panic attack is the Potomac because I don't think I can sit long enough to do that. And it's 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 a cultural thing. If you grow up on Kerr or North Carolina, like that's literally what you have to do to yeah. generally speaking, to cash a check. Yeah, you you've got to cover spots. And I, I think Kerr is a spot lake too. I mean, I know it's everybody says it's a pattern lake. I'm not saying that. I have done that before. But the more I fish it, every year goes by, I'm starting to see. And sometimes it's, you know, every other year they'll load up, but they reuse the same spots. And it's kind of freaky that they reuse the same spots at the same time. Uh, it's like there's some internal clock that says, hey, go set up on this point or these sets of point, one of these three points for these three weeks out of this month. Um, I don't know what's bringing them there, but they, they do set up that way. What would you consider a true pattern lake then? For me, a pattern lake, and like I said, I've, we've done this on bugs, which is, hey, they're on like a brim bed bite we were on one time. It's They weren't in the back of every pocket. Every pocket you go in, there's these subtle little fingers or little like little pockets within the pockets. They'd be on the first one or two of those at every main lake pocket, but the pocket couldn't be, it, you, want, you want it a little bit deep in the back. So then we just started trying to find all of those and we just started running that and catching fish. And then it was, you know, a specific kind of dock. Um, there was a bite we were on and it was, it was going to be the first two docks and every main lake cut. And after a while, you just didn't even have to fish in the rest of them. You just go hit those two on this side, those two on the side and you go, uh, and you run that. So, I mean, it, it, it is a pattern or a secondary points with some rock. That's a, you know, it's kind of an obvious one, but, um, I think too, they relate to the same water depth. Uh, 
So if you get on fish and they're some for some reason they're relating to that 12 to 14 foot range, you can kind of go at every point in that area and start to stay in that 12 or 14 point range and they're relating to the depth. And mm-hmm. if you would consider that a pattern, I would say, you know, points in the same depth. Uh, that's, you know, that's a pattern on bugs sometimes. That's freaking awesome. Well, I mean, I really appreciate you coming on uh, today. Is there anything we can promote for you? What do you got coming up? Uh, shout out to sponsors or anything like that. Nothing coming up. Uh, again, Brandon Curtis at Southside Southern Boat Works keeps me on the water, so I always want to give him a shout out. Uh, but yeah, I just I don't have anything coming up. Though. We've got the two day the two day five alive classic coming up in September. Uh, I'm going to fish that, and I'm going to go play with some stripers this weekend in the hurricane on Friday. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, that's really my only plans. It's just doing some fun fishing until that five alive classic. And then after that, it's going to be the cat trails this fall on curve. I'm going to jump into those until the stripers start biting good. And then nobody will see me for a couple months unless you see me out there striper fishing. Dude, that sounds like you're living the dream. Um, yeah. that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, guys, uh, the winners are, let me see, uh, Christian, Christian share. We just want to gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. And then let's go with, uh, Everett Garner. You also want to gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. You know, the drill message me on Facebook, Instagram, or email me fishing DMV at gmail.com. The other thing is guys, again, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I mentioned it again, uh, Saturday, August 17th at 6 PM is going to be the Patreon meetup. I'll be putting a poll out on our private group and email what kind of food you guys want to eat. So I don't kill anyone. We'll get that going there. We also will have Tyler high poll and I'm getting a couple more guys. They're going to be there also just to ask your questions. Not really a seminar thing. Just to basically chill talk. We got some cool things we're going to be giving away and getting some orders for our big meetup this fall. We're going to have a massive meetup this fall. That one is going to have captain Steve Chaconis. It's going to have a guide from the Shannon river the susquehanna river the potomac river the upper potomac it's going to be a big old river shindig but that's going to be later on in the fall and we're going to talk about that as well like and subscribe channel and we will see you guys next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked